Thank you so much. It's really great to be here. I was here 10 years ago as an undergraduate attending uh, Aspen Winter Conference um, and felt very fortunate. And so it's really surreal to be part of this experience again as an organizer. Um, so this is a free public lecture series, as many of you know, that's had a very long history and has been generos generously supported by the Nick and Maggie DeWolf Foundation. Um, this, this series goes back 30 years and it allows us to communicate scientific discoveries, mathematical discoveries as well, with the public. And I think that public uh, academic interface is really important. Um, well, our conference is all about late stage stellar and planetary systems, trying to understand what happens when stars die, what happens to their planetary architecture, what can we learn about the formation and the composition of those planets by these very late stages. In fact, there's been lots of exciting uh, developments during this week. In People just proposing new survey designs for space and ground-based uh, telescopes. And uh, it allows us to really identify together in an interdisciplinary way, bringing chemists, planetary scientists, theorists and observers in astronomy, among many other fields, to solve and to really precisely describe what are the open problems in astronomy that we're dealing with in this subdomain, what can we do to address them over maybe a decade time scale. Um, so yes, so without further ado, it's a really huge pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Mullally, who uh, is at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And when I first heard that, that had such a strange name, and I, I realized that that actually was the original name of the Hubble Space Telescope. So before it was coined Hubble, that's where that name comes from. Mm -hmm. And that is the headquarters where many of the space-based survey information is, uh, is conducted. So uh, Dr. Susan Mullally works on exoplanet searches using NASA space telescopes. In fact, she worked on the Kepler mission, for those of you that might be familiar with Kepler. Um, which revolutionized our understanding of exoplanets and made it made us realize as a community um, that actually exoplanets are incredibly prevalent. If you look up at the stars tonight, recognize that nearly every single star that you're seeing very likely does have a planet orbiting it. We're very interested in whether or not those planets might be habitable. How frequently does life arise? Um, and how can late stage systems tell us more about that? She's a graduate of Hanover College and UNC Chapel Hill. And she spent the past five years now at Space Telescope Science Institute and is specifically working with the Science Operations Center for the James Webb Space Telescope. And she's going to talk about today about this telescope you probably heard a lot about, JWST, and give you some never before seen details of the universe that we've been able to unveil with this amazing instrument. I really do think space telescopes are modern day cathedrals. The amount of innovation and energy and ingenuity that has to come together to make these things happen. The fact that we do it for knowledge, for the sake of knowledge, is really one of the most beautiful things that I've ever experienced. And with that, without further ado, welcome Susan. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you all for joining me tonight. I am just absolutely humbled that this many people came out to tonight to learn more about astronomy and the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, um, let me myself situated here. Yeah, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I love this idea of space telescopes being cathedrals and knowledge for knowledge sake, because that's exactly what uh, gets me up in the morning and makes me so excited to work and uh, just to make everything that is required to bring together astronomers and engineers and, um, and uh, scientists to come and really learn more about the universe using superb new data that we're able to get from the James Webb Space Telescope. And so I'm gonna go through um, some great new images uh, that the web has taken, as well as tell you a little bit more about how the project came about. Um, yeah, and as you said, I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute. We are the place that is operating the Webb Space Telescope. We do everything from interacting with the scientists and help know where to point the telescope to get the best science out, to help to processing that data and delivering it to the scientific community as well as to the public. Uh, so um, it's, it's a, an exciting place to be working these days. Okay. So I'm not going to assume that everybody here is an expert in astronomy or the James Webb Space Telescope. So if everything we've said so far makes no sense, don't worry. I'm going to, oh, this isn't working now. First, I'm quiet. I'm going to start where? <laughs> Go out on a night, brilliant night sky, maybe not tonight. <laughs> Pick another clear, beautiful night. Um, I used to come to Colorado a lot as a kid. Um, because my family 
my mom was from uh, Pueblo and uh, her sister, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> uh, and so we have a cabin out in Beulah and my aunt <laughs> lives in Denver. So I try to visit as much as I can, but this is actually my first time in Aspen. And uh, first of all, I got to ski the Aspen mountains, which was great. Um, but I love places that you can get away from the night lights. I grew up in Wisconsin, so I could do this very easily. And you can just look up and just see swarms of stars. Mm -hmm. And so maybe if you go out on a night like tonight, you would go out and see the Orion, constellation Orion. I hope this constellation is familiar to at least many of you in this room because it's big, it's bright, it's beautiful. And you're looking at these beautiful, hot, big stars. Um, Betelgeuse is a very famous one that you see up here in the upper, oh, think of my right and left confused. Let's call it the right-hand shoulder of Orion, you know, which way he's facing. And these are stars that are in our Milky Way galaxy. They're actually not terribly far away, um, but they're big, bright, and hot. These are things we know. But if you kept looking deeper and got a bigger telescope, or actually, in some cases, not even all that big of a telescope, you might look beyond all these stars that are in our own Milky Way. And you'd get out and you'd see big spiral structures. And we came to realize that we are just one of, Milky Way is just one galaxy amongst many galaxies out there in our universe. These galaxies contain tens of billions of stars like our sun. We live in a galaxy that contains tens of billions of stars like our sun. If you looked even farther, even to a darker patch of sky like the Hubble Space Telescope, how many people have heard of the Hubble Space Telescope? Ah, excellent. <laughs> um, you might find something like this, which was the Hubble Deep Field. In, oh. 16, I think they redid it, 2017. Um, so each one of these blobs you see on here, that's a technical term, blobs, are um, galaxies, many of which are so far away that you're seeing them at the oh, 13, as the universe was 13 billion years ago. Now you said, Susan, wait, did you say you looked back in time and saw the universe as it was 13 billion years ago? I mean, that's a big time machine. And this comes from basically an interesting property of our universe that the um, speed of light is finite. It takes time for light to get to us. When you turn on the lights, it's actually not instantaneous that it hits your eye, it just feels that way. If you suddenly hit light covers distances, like 13 billion light years, it actually then takes 13 billion years to get to us. And that means you're actually seeing the universe as it was when that light was admitted 13 billion years ago. <laughs> And so you could imagine then, I'm putting universe on a timeline and something that might look something like this. This bottom axis is a timeline and where the beginning of it is 13.8 billion years ago, our understanding of how old the universe is. And on the other end is today, where you see the James Webb Space Telescope, where we're observing it. Uh, after the Big Bang, so this is the beginning of the universe, Big Bang, the universe started to expand. At some point, the density of the universe got low enough, and um, the, uh, we ended up with neutral hydrogen, which allowed then light to escape. And this created the last scattering surface, or which we've actually been able to observe, the cosmic microwave background. Have you people heard of that? Mm -hmm. A few, yes, awesome. We've seen that. So we've seen all the way back to here. Amazing. Then there's this dark ages that happens, where basically have a whole bunch of neutral hydrogen hanging about, a little bit of helium. And then sometime later, we have observations of galaxies that came from Hubble Space Telescope. They go about here, about, I don't know, 200 million years after the Big Bang. But we've never actually seen what happens in between. But how did you get from the hydrogen, neutral hydrogen, to these basically fully formed galaxies that I showed you here? How do you go from one to the other? And it's with that purpose in mind that people first started designing the James Webb Space Telescope to solve that mystery of what are the very first stars and galaxies? Do stars form first and then they cluster together into galaxies? Or do you get gas come together and then they're already in clumps and then galaxies form? These are the questions we want to answer. And that means we have to find galaxies even farther away than the ones that we saw with the Hubble Space. Now to do that, you need a design telescope that can see them, right? So that's when we have to think, think hard, and realize we need to understand what would those galaxies look like? And 
this comes around to another interesting property of our universe is that it is expanding and getting bigger and bigger. And that means that if you have two things that are at opposite ends of the universe, expanding, that they're moving farther and farther apart from each other. And this causes light to get what we call redshifted. It means that if it's emitted at blue light, or maybe ultraviolet light, even I, really high energy light, as it travels across the universe through this expanding universe, that light gets shifted into redder and redder wavelengths. I apologize for showing the plot, but you get this blue light transmitted into redder and redder wavelengths. And I promise not to show them anymore. Oh no, I'm picked that back. The whole end is full of plots. Yeah. You'll love them. So that means we not only need a big telescope that can see really dim stars, we all kind of accept that, right? Like galaxies that are really far away are probably really dim just because they're really far away. We also need a telescope that's really sensitive to very red light. Light that's even redder than your eye can see called infrared light. And with that, the, um, the NASA, the Canadian Space Agency and the European Space Agency got together, and built James Webb Space Telescope, which is a six and a half meter telescope that's flying in space with huge sun shields to keep it incredibly cold so that it is sensitive enough to be able to see infrared light and see the very beginning of the universe when the very first stars and galaxies formed. Here's the thing, when you build a big powerful telescope like this, you can do way more than just see galaxies at the other end. And we'll get to that by the end. As you heard, I work on exoplanets, so I can't get to this talk without talking about exoplanets. <laughs> um, and so I'm not gonna hold you in suspense. The telescope has been operating for hmm, about a year now. Um, and so, it, it's turning to, it's really successful. This is the first image that the James Webb Space Telescope released. It's so exciting that President Biden released it. <laughs> um, he scooped us all. He said, nope, I'm doing it. And, uh, <laughs> and so he showed this at a press release. This is the first very deep image. It was the intent was to do essentially what you saw in that Hubble deep field, to, to focus on one small patch of sky and go as deep as you can and as far away as you can. Because of the immense precision that you get and um, of the focused mirrors of the telescope, um, and you can get, we, this is the deepest image at the time that was taken. We've been operating now for a year and already they've surpassed this. We'll get to. But as you can see here, what you're looking at actually is a foreground galaxy, which is what this big light, bright blob is. No, it's something like, wait, I wrote this down, 4.2 billion light years away. So it's really close by, only 4.2 billion light years away. And as a result, the, um, it has a really high gravity full of gravity, both from the stars and the dark matter that's in that galaxy is bending the light in galaxies that are behind it. So it's acting like its own lens and magnifying and distorting the galaxies that are behind it. And that's why you see those arcs that are around the edges. In some ways we're using the universe as a telescope and allowing us to see even farther away. So, this, it was very exciting. When we got to put this out, it was just like, on it, we're going to be successful. Now we have to get to work and do the science. Okay, so now I'm going to take a step back. What is the James Webb Space Telescope? How did we get to here? As I mentioned, it's a six and a half meter space telescope. It's one of its primary features is its mirror. As you can, this is just a focus of the mirror before it launched. I like it because it has people in it. Um, so you can get a sense of the size. Six and a half meters is even hard for me to visualize. I keep thinking like this, and it's like, no, <laughs> it's house size. And so each of those individual mirrors, um, it's made of 18 of them. And um, those are each about a little over a meter across, three feet. Um, and each of those mirrors can be moved up and down and around to create a perfect focus. We can get that nice parabolic arc you need in order to get really precise images. The, the secondary mirror, so the light comes in, bounces off that primary mirror, secondary mirror is actually folded up. And um, that was kind of the other major thing that the James Webb Space Telescope was um, known for, uh, is that it just had to be this amazing feat of engineering. We had to invent a lot of technologies in order to make this work. Uh, one of the things was, for instance, how to keep things really cold because we wanted to observe infrared light. But another was is that we had to fold up the telescope in order to send it into space because we wanted to put our telescope in a 16 foot 
they load fairing at the end of a rocket. So the telescope had to be able to fold up to fit in there and then had to be able to unfold in space after it had been shooken around at, by launch. So that all had to work. So you can imagine this is why it took 20 years to build this telescope. We really had to make sure it worked. And so um, I'll show you the unfolding in a second. The, the launch was uh, uh, December 25th, 2021. Christmas morning, best Christmas present ever. Yay, in the middle of a pandemic, boo. Um, but, I mean, my kids were actually kind of happy because it meant I didn't have to go to work on Christmas morning. I got to do it all from home instead of having to cycle work from home instead and still watch Santa and open presents. But it was a great, great morning. Did anybody watch the launch? Five. It was a really beautiful launch. Like it was, perfect. it was European Space Agency put it on an Ariane five rocket uh, and sent it into space in such precision that means that we probably have enough fuel to keep James Webb orbiting out where it is for up to twenty years. So as long as nothing else breaks, get a lot of data from this telescope. So we're very excited by that. Um, after it got oh, I, oh, I like this video. So oh, I had to go up there. The video, the, um, the fairing came off, leaving the telescope. This is the last stage of the rocket. So it's the thing that pushed it off at the very end after it was in space, but it had a camera on it. So this was our last real view of James Webb Space Telescope. So that video there on your right um, is uh, the actual video of the telescope opening up its solar array. At that point, we knew we were gonna have power um, the sun shining on those solar rays and giving us power. That was our last view as it sent it off into space to where it was going to go. As it did, as it went off to its uh, final location, which I'll get to, um, it had to unfold in space. This was a very nerve wracking time. Every move you were afraid it wasn't going to unlatch and wasn't going to open. At every instance it did. And so what happened is those big pallets came down um, you had the sun shields had to come out. There's five of these big, I call them mylar balloons. It's really not the material, but it, it's a big shiny things. There's five of them. Then they had to be tensioned. And those are used to keep the telescope cool. Secondary mirror had to come down. And then the other mirrors came forward. So we had 18. And you have it fully folded, about a month. At that point, had to focus the telescope, <laughs> which meant we had to move each of these individual little mirrors and take another picture and say, okay, instead of 18 stars, now we have to bring the 18 stars in, and we have to make sure they're all at the right focus. It was a good fun times, but it was slow. Because <laughs> each time you had to tell the telescope what to do, and then it would come back down again. Why did it take a month? Why take a month to focus? Because of that time, which to unfold, because we want to do it very slowly and very carefully. So every command, you have to say, checklist, I have everything, it's at go 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 all right we can do this one click and they'd send it and then you had to get verification that it happened <laughs> and then you say okay now we're ready for the next thing and you do it one at a time the thing at this telescope in space you can't make any mistakes you have to do things slowly and methodically um also the whole time this is happening it's cooling you couldn't really take data at this time anyhow but we weren't in a hurry to unfold it this was not the limiting step to get us out there we had to get out to um, our location in space, which is actually the next slide. <clears throat> we had to get all the way out 1.5 million kilometers out to a place we call L2. It's a second Lagrange point. It's just this place out in space where there, there's spacecraft there, but there's nothing else. And actually even the spacecraft aren't at L2, they're all orbiting L2. It's just a nice energetically favorable place to orbit in space. It keeps us always 1.5 million kilometers from earth. And it allows you to keep the sun shields pointed to the sun again so that they reflect all the sunlight back keep the telescope cool um so we're in these big halo orbits around l2 we were traveling out there the whole time we were unfolding and focusing the telescope okay so i keep talking about how one side's hot and one side's cold this is kind of a close-up of the telescope again we have these five layers here keep it really cold and on the cold side is where we have the telescope and the cameras, the detectors that take all the pictures. And they're all on the back side, along with all the mirrors. Uh, on the hot side over here is where we have like the solar array, so it can see the sun. It's where we communicate. You can see on there the antenna and talk back to Earth. That's all on the hot side. 
reason we have to keep the telescope really cold is because we're looking in infrared light. All of us here are emitting an infrared light. Everything that is warm emits an infrared light. So the colder you make it, less infrared light it emits. You have to keep the telescope cold. Otherwise, all we're going to see is the telescope. I didn't want to see the telescope. <laughs> so I'm going to see the universe. And so that's why I had to keep it cold. That's also why we sent it out to L2. That way we can keep the telescope far away from the sun and the earth. And we can keep that cold side really cold. Uh, a cold side gets down to 40 Kelvin, which is like minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. It's really cold. The hot side actually gets quite hot. It's about 200 degrees Fahrenheit on the other side. So this is an incre incredible insulating layer that NASA built. Okay. So the way we talk to Webb is using um, Deep Space uh, Network, which has radio telescopes in California, Spain, and oh gosh, lost it. Australia. Thank you, Australia. <laughs> Canberra, thank you. <laughs> and um, so, uh, it, so, so from Baltimore, which is where we are at Space Telescope Science Institute, send, say, this is what we want to say to Webb, then get sent up to Webb via the Deep Space Network. And then when it might say, hey, send us down your data, the data then comes back down through the DSN, comes back to Baltimore. Uh, this is what the Mission Control Center looks like. It's basically just a lot of really big computer screens and lots of hardworking people trying to make sure the telescope stays in orbit and is staying healthy and figuring out what the next command it needs to send it in order to take the next observations. Once all that data comes down, it gets sent, uh, it gets processed through at the Space Telescope Institute and put into our uh, the NASA archive known as MAST. Um, NASA is located in Baltimore, not in the ocean, like that point seems to show. And um, <laughs> on the within, this is three. This is from November to January. These are all the countries high, highlighted in green are people who came and took some of the web data. So the web data is now everywhere around the world. What is in this data? You might be wondering. Well, as I said, it's not just studying galaxies at the edge of the universe. It's studying everything from how those galaxies change over time to the life cycle of stars and exoplanets, and, and also to study the worlds, those other worlds themselves, exoplanets around other stars. And so I'm going to now um, relate a, li a little bit more about some of the images we've gotten down to show you some of the universe that we've seen with the Webb Space Telescope. This is just to remind you again, observing in the infrared. I'm going to show you pictures that you're going to see with optical light. Um, but Webb really is in this nice little sweet spot where, like Hubble observed in uh, essentially optical light, a little bit of UV, a little bit of infrared. The Spitzer Space Telescope was another telescope uh, that Na NASA had that did the mid to far infrared. So Webb is kind of filling in that gap. But the pictures I'm going to show you all <laughs> are, were taken in the infrared. We had to translate the light so you could see them with your eyes. So keep that in mind. So we take, take them in three different colored filters, and then we say the bluest of that light, which is actually really red <laughs> is now blue and somewhere in the middle is green and then the red is red red really red is red so keep that in mind as you're looking at these images why do we want to look in the infrared besides looking for those distant galaxies um, infrared actually has other properties though so that light makes it allows us to study things in different ways we get more information by studying across the spectrum this is a picture of a guy with his hands under a garbage bag <laughs> um, both in optical and infrared light. So you can see in the infrared light, you can see his hands to the bag. And the same thing happens when we use infrared light for looking at the universe. The infrared light isn't scattered by dust and gas as much as, as optical light is. And as a result, we can see deeper past um, some of the gas and dust in our universe, and see things like formation of stars, which you can see gloriously in this picture of the pillars of creation. I'm hoping some of you have seen these images before. These are some of my favorites. This is one of the images that HST took. And you can see these, these great tall pillars that um, are where new stars are being born. And you have gas and dust that's collapsing on itself. And as that happens, jets might come off into the stars, which then spur on new star formation. And but you can see there's also all these dark regions that the optical light from Webb um, couldn't peer through to see the stars. 
then when you look at James Webb, this was an image taken with its near cam detector. And you can see even more stars through the gas and dust. And so you can see deep into some of the cocoons where star formation is happening. And you see the little red blips at the very top. That's where we're actually seeing some of the very brand new stars. It might be hard to see, they're very tiny. At the end, I'm gonna give you the website where you can get all these pictures. Worry. I have no idea what I'm looking at here. Yeah, okay, that's a fair, fair comment. <laughs> this is a nebula in the Eagle Nebula. You have a sense of scale there? It. Oh, yeah, I can give you that too. Second, I'm going to learn to use my pointer. Okay. This is about um, about 10 light years across. That helps. 10 light years? 10 light years. Yeah, give or take. And you're looking at a nebula. So this is all gas and dust. And inside, you have these little cocoons of stars that are starting to form. They collapse because under their own weight due to gravity. As that happens, sometimes um, jets come out the end of the stars, just as the new star is born. And that creates some of these like, um, like this little part here where you get like, what do we call it? Like fluffs of gas and dust come out. But when you're looking in the infrared, you can see past, I find this, okay. You can see past, like you see all this gas and dust you see here, you can see through to where you see stars here, right? Mm -hmm. So it's partly to demonstrate to you that in infrared, we're seeing through that gas and dust and you can see through these stars. At the very end here, you can see the little red blob up here. That is actually a brand new star that was just born. Now, you can also look out into the mid infrared, which is what this one was. This was released on Halloween. It's very <laughs> creepy, the claw <laughs> of creation. I don't know. Um, it, uh, all this blue light, it, it's, it's not actually blue light, it's still infrared, right? All this blue turbulence, this is actually now we're looking at the dust itself. This is the light that's coming from the dust that we see in the universe. So as a result, we can start measuring how massive, how much dust there is in these clouds. I think we had trouble doing with, with other instruments before. What do you mean by dust? Oh yeah, that's a good question too. It's like silicate, salts, all sorts of things. Little tiny little particles out there in space. Some of it are even organic. It's, it might be in these clouds. But that now we can study what those dusts are made of as well. But you're right. It's not like the dust you find on your uh, counters, for instance. <laughs> okay, so I've ta been talking a little bit about star formation, but uh, James Webb isn't going to just do star formation. It's actually also going to talk about the whole stellar life cycle, which I thought was appropriate because that's what we're talking about here at our conference. <laughs> um, we're not just talking about the beginning of stars. We talk about the ends of star lives. Um, so I thought it was, this was a nice little diagram that talked about basically stars go under two different life cycles. If it's a small star, things like our sun, or maybe a couple times the size of our sun, maybe smaller, um, they will evolve, they will go along for like billions of years. So our sun is about 5 billion years old. And then eventually they become, they run out of fuel in their core, which is hydrogen fusion is what's happening there. And that happens and it, it becomes a red giant star, it fluffs up. And then it goes through, some of them go through this planetary nebula stage. Where all, it suddenly ejects out all of the outer layers of the star off into space. And then it glows because of the central star. And the central star is this remnant core we call a white dwarf star, which is about the size of the Earth. It's about the mass of the sun. So it's super, super dense. More massive stars do a whole different life cycle. They form here in uh, nebulas just in the same way. If it's a massive star, something let's say 10 times the size of the sun, um, it eventually goes through a similar red giant phase. It might then go through, through huge winds that will come off of it um, and create a nebula around it. That happens in some cases, and I'll show you a picture of that. Eventually that center, of they runs out of fuel as well, and it eventually has no more fuel to burn, and it goes supernova and it explodes and turns into either a neutron star or a black hole. In that process, both of these are returning back to the, the star forming nebula, some of the materials that it had when it was a star. It's now been enriched with um, what I'm going to call metals, I'll call it heavier elements, right? It's getting enriched with, with, with heavier elements. Um, instead of just being hydrogen and helium before, you might you have um, carbon or calcium now in those materials. Supernova are great at doing. Yes. Do you have heavier metals as a result of the fusion that took place? That does happen in the core of the, the, the massive stars. You actually build all the way up to 
iron. Mm -hmm. When you get to iron, you can't um, fuse anymore and still get energy back. And so as a result, that's why it goes supernova. But actually in the explosion itself, it causes all sorts of heavy elements to get formed um, due to all sorts of neutrons being crammed into atoms. Yeah, <laughs> okay. This is a smart audience. I'm sorry, I didn't know I was gonna be so on my toes. I'm gonna have to go back and... Okay, so let me show you some of the images we have of dying stars. I showed you stellar Earth systems dying stars. This is a planetary nebula as seen. Um, this is called the Southern Ring Nebula. I've seen it actually in the near infrared and in the far, in the mid infrared. So you have near cam on one side and Miri on the other side. I know I didn't really go through the instruments, but those are both two different things that can take pictures on, on JWST. Um, what was fun about these, you can see these, this is bubble basically forms. This is, this is the material that came off of the star before a white dwarf formed in the center. What was interesting about this one, I immediately saw that and said, that's the white dwarf. Turns out it's not. This is a binary system. There's two stars going around each other. And the white dwarf is in this image. You can't really see it, but you can see it over here as the dimmer star of that pair. And this, for the first time, using that mid-infrared um, wavelengths, you're able to see that that um, white dwarf it actually is covered in dust. And that's why it glows so red in that image. It's still able to energetically um, highlight this wonderful gas and dust that's, that it gave off earlier in its life. And then if you want to look at even more massive stars and how they evolved, this is a, what they call a wolf ray star. It's a super massive star just before it goes supernova. No, no, 1,000 years before it goes supernova or something. But this was the HST image of it. And this is the web image of it. And again, you can see like it's a very turbulent gas that comes off. It seems to give off a material in, in a regular fashion. And it's uh, again, the energy from the light is highlighting, uh, lighting up all that gas for us to see. But out in the, the mid infrareds, we can see the gas and dust that are out there. And now we can actually count up how much and what kind of dust is out there. And we can then measure how that gets returned back into the next round of star formation. And we learn how the universe enriches itself with these heavier materials. Okay, I'm gonna show you a lot of pictures now. So now, how I return back to plots, yay. <laughs> we have to talk about spectra because you can't do web without, James Webb without spectra. Spectra is when I split all the light up into its many colors. You've seen spectra all the time because everybody's seen a rainbow. It's a spectrum, nothing to be scared of. We tend to, as astronomers, like to show them as plots. So how bright it is versus what color it is, okay? And hot glowing things basically look like this. But masses that are made really hot tend to emit something we call the emission spectra, and they only emit at particular wavelengths. And from these patterns, where it gets bright, it can tell you what the material is made of, and tell you things like how hot that material is, how much of it there is, all things like that. So why we love spectra is it allows us to um, uncode all the universe and tell us more about what's there, more than you can get from a pretty picture. And so let me just highlight one, uh, one image that shows that just kind of clearly showed how a spectra can tell us what things <clears throat> are made of. This is actually a picture of a bunch of colliding galaxies. And they, they took spectra of the center of one of them where they know there's this really active black hole where stuff keeps falling into a black hole and you get um, all the, the jets that come off of it. And so all this energy gets spurred back out at us and it shows up as emission spectra. So really hot gas shines suddenly at particular wavelengths. We get these peaks. And the pattern of those peaks tells us what that material is made of. You get silicates, for instance, where you get dips because some of that light went through some material, it gets uh, blocked by a little bit of these silicates, but you also get the emission features from like sulfur and neon and oxygen. So that's why spectra is so important to us. The other reason spectra is so important to us comes down to this um, Father Ted meme that I found. Who knows Father Ted? No one? Oh, what? So, okay, I'm sorry, I had to put this in here even though I knew no one knows Father Ted because I saw Father Ted for the first time when I was in Colorado. And if you haven't seen it, it's a 1990s sitcom <laughs> made in Ireland about two Irish priests who are on a very rural island in Ireland. 
And one of them, um, Father Ed, uh, Father uh, Ted is this one. And then um, Father said, the Father Dougal, and he's a little simple minded and have to have things explained to him. It's just very childlike, it's fine. Um, but they had a very rainy day on their vacation. And so um, it was, all they do is come into this moment when they're showing him a cow and says, okay, I'm gonna tell you this one more time. These cows are small. Those you see out the window are far away. And he goes, <laughs> and so the thing is, it, it just hits home the problem in astronomy to me is that we see these galaxies and just from how big they are, you cannot tell how far away they are. They might just be small, right? <laughs> so how do we know how far away anything is? And from spectra is how we can um, do this. And so that's when we're going to talk about those red shifts again. Remember how the light gets shifted from um, due to the expanding cosmological universe, right? So the light goes along, it gets turned to redder and redder light. So that means you can find those emission features like I talked, to, from, talked about from one of these galaxies. And then you find them at these wavelengths for this galaxy, but you find that same pattern, this galaxy a little farther to the red, like at three microns, and then a little farther to the red here, right? And that is because this galaxy is farther away, 13 billion light years away, is this one is only 11 billion light years away. And so from spectra of these galaxies and images like this, we can determine how far away galaxies are because we live in this expanding universe. And we now understand spectra. <laughs> so doing that, I'm going to show you some things that are a little bit more cutting edge here. Um, they have taken very big, deep surveys now um, using the Webb Space Telescope. And they have now seen even galaxies even more far away than, than I showed you with these first images. And these are two of the ones that they think are most far away. The Z, oh, sorry. Can't use this thing. I should stop trying. So um, these little blobs they've determined to be um, at, you know, about 400 million years after the Big Bang. So the, some of the very earliest seen light from the very early stage of the galaxy. So, um, and I'll zoom in on them. That too, I'll give you a nice close-up look. So I was just on Twitter and I've been told that there might be even one even farther away announced on Friday. So this is the game that's happening now. People are finding these galaxies even farther and farther away. But here's the thing, so far only have photometry for this. They haven't gotten their spectra yet. And from those spectra is when they can really confirm those redshift. So these are what we like to call candidates. This is how science progresses. We first get our first measurements, right? And we, we have a pretty good hypothesis. And this we say, can we confirm that? Can we become really sure of it? And that's the stage we're in. We're trying to, are these galaxies that formed at the very edge beginning of the universe? Because if they are, it's really interesting because we're surprised to find galaxies so kind of tightly compact and already organized at such an early stage. So we're already learning about what that early universe might be like. Okay, yes. Can you? Can you um, picture a slice of time? So like you cut out everything that is not as old as 13 billion. Years. Then can I show you just galaxies that are a particular time? Exactly. Yes, and that's exactly what they're trying to do. I can't show it to you right here today because I didn't put the talk together that way. But there are people who can say, here are a bunch of galaxies at that stage of the universe and here are a bunch at that stage of the universe. And then they look for patterns. So they can say, how do galaxies progress and evolve over time? You have this flip book of time, you know, it's like watch galaxies evolve. So the galaxies form and then they interact with each other and they eventually form into these big massive spiral galaxies that we see around us today. So that is what they're trying to do. It's a great question. Okay. I need to get to exoplanets and I have 10 minutes to do it. <laughs> so as I said, just because we build a big telescope, that means we get to do even cool science around stuff, stuff that isn't so far away. Most everything I've shown you is like thousands of light years away, if not you know, 13 billion light years away. But exoplanets, we like to study the ones that aren't so close, so aren't so far away. So planets are um, planets orbiting other stars. We have planets in our own solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, Neptune, things like that. But we also have found now um, more than 5,000 planets orbiting other stars. And that's a lot. And exoplanets are super exciting because I think 
Um, we've been thinking about them forever. <laughs> in fact, I was like trying to figure out how long people, you know, like just our imaginations are just full of ideas of people going to other worlds. In fact, the first evidence I found of someone writing about a story, for instance, going on a different world was from 1666. That's how long ago. Um, so this is has been going on for a while and people have great imaginations is it dusty worlds or the worlds are going to atmospheres that are going to kill you or, or are they all like big lush forests like California I don't you know like in Star Wars um but as a scientist we're not really content with just what can we imagine we actually want to measure as you can imagine for exoplanets um there's, it's really important to not just to know a lot about them. You want to know about their atmospheres, how big they are, all sorts of measurements. And, and so um, if you've been paying attention to any of the exoplanets we have found, we tend to show you lots of pictures like this. We show you, say, we found an exoplanet, and we believe maybe it has oceans and continents, or we might say it's a big puffy thing like Jupiter. The truth is, this is all we really know. And the rest of it, we've put models on it. We said, we think it might be like this, but there's a lot of room for things it could be. And so we actually really just kind of know how big it is, its radius, how long it takes to go around its star. For a good many now, we know things like how massive it is as well. So it's density, which tells us things like, is it made of rock or is it just big puffy gas? Um, but and for a few, we now know it has an atmosphere. Like for a few, we have measured their atmosphere. With Webb, we're going to be able to measure those atmospheres with even more precision. And if, I, I don't think it takes much to convince you that knowing an atmosphere is important because there are three lovely terrestrial planets in our solar system, Venus, Earth, and Mars. There's only one I want to live on, I'll tell you. Mars has almost no atmosphere, and Venus will kill you before you get to the surface. <laughs> so um, atmospheres are important. So there's basically two techniques that people are using to study uh, there's more, of course, but two basic big ones that people are using to study atmospheres, James Webb Space Telescope. And one is to directly image those exoplanets. Direct imaging pretty much sounds like it is. I'm going to take a picture of the exoplanet. Done. It's tricky to take pictures of um, exoplanets. It's not because they're so dim. It's because they aren't particularly bright, but they're sitting next to something that is really bright, big, bright star. And so we have to use a technique, uh, use an instrument called a chronograph frequently to block out the light, the big bright star, in order to see the dim things next to it. I put this picture here just to remind you, you can imagine like standing around car headlights, right? You can't see anything, right? Until you put your hand up and then you can see the car around it. Basically the same concept. We need to block out the light from the, um, from the main star to see the planet. This picture here is not from Webb. I'll make no claims of that. It's taken from the ground. We've been able to do um, direct imaging ex exoplanets for a while now. Um, but you can see they blocked out the star and then put a little convenient yellow star on it so you know where it was. And then you can see the planets going around it. This actually took seven years to pull this image together. It's amazing. Those are actually the orbits of the planets. This is why direct imaging is cool. You can follow the orbits. You can directly see the planet. Um, we have now done that for Webb. This is um, uh, one exoplanet. It's about seven times the mass of Jupiter, so a very big exoplanet known as, oh, a lovely name, 5426. Um, and so here's where the star was. They use a chronograph to block it out. And then you get um, the star in different colors. So these are mid infrared wavelengths, and these are in um, near infrared wavelengths. Uh, just to give you some perspective, you take like a ground based image, you get these images like this. You have to zoom in. This is how close the star and the planet are. Like, you just can't do this from the ground because you need this really high resolution of web in order to separate the, the star from, even after you've used the chronograph, separate the star from the planet. Um, with this technique, Webb has the ability to study atmospheres, planets as small as Saturn. Most of these planets will probably be very young. Um, you know, maybe you know, Jupiter is probably five billion years old, old just like our sun. But uh, the planets that Webb is most, a lot of his time study are probably very young, things that are, you know, 10 million years old, 1,000 years old. But there's another technique you can use to study atmospheres of exoplanets, and that's using transits. This is actually a picture of Venus transiting the sun. So, as you can imagine, 
if you have just the right inclination of a planet going around a star, sometimes they go right in front of their star that blocks some of the light. This is what we call a transit. If you zoom in on this picture of Venus in front of our sun, this is just like a transit. You actually see this yellow glow all the way around. That's the atmosphere of Venus, right? Some of the light from the sun actually goes through that atmosphere before it gets to us. Along the way, as it goes through that atmosphere, if it's a particular wavelength, it can interact with that atmosphere and some of the light gets blocked by that atmosphere. That means we can use transiting exoplanets to study the atmospheres of transiting exoplanets. And I did this already with the James Webb Space Telescope. What this means is if you look at the transit, so this is a transit, how bright it is versus time. As the planet goes in front, this, the whole thing gets dimmer, and then it gets brighter again. Okay? You do that in different wavelengths of light, which they're showing with three different colors on here, and they zoomed in at the bottom. You can see that for this green wavelength of light versus the red wavelength of light, it's a different depth. Okay, it means more of the light that is red gets blocked. Right, green gets blocked. You get a deeper transit. And if you then translate those depths into a spectrum like this, you can see how much is blocked versus the wavelength of light. And you get bumps like this due to things like carbon dioxide in the surface. This is a planet, known as WASP 39b. And we now have detected carbon dioxide in that giant planet. Okay. This is the technique they're using. Now we're gonna be doing this for loads of giant planets going around other stars. We also hope to be able to reach down to doing terrestrial planets. Most likely only gonna do that for terrestrial planets orbiting small stars because the transits get deeper and you have the same size planet going around a small star, you get a deeper transit and so you get better signal to noise. So you make more precise measurements around those. So that means for these small planets going around small stars, we might be able to do it for small rocky planets like our own, things that are the size of the earth. I did this very recently and those white points in there, the spectrum they got, and you look at that and you go, Susan, there's no big bump. <laughs> and they said the same thing. They said, there's no big bump. We can't find anything on this. But using that, they actually could rule out a model that was like this green one, which is actually a methane atmosphere, which is similar um, to uh, an atmosphere you might find on Saturn's moon known as Titan. So we're getting there. We're trying to learn how to best use these instruments and figure out how many transits we have to get in order to find atmospheres around some of these terrestrial worlds, worlds we have found. And the little luck, we might be able to then look at a spectrum and say, does it have the same materials as things like here on Earth? Or maybe it's more like Venus, or maybe it's more like Titan. And so we can do that. And so in the last two minutes I have here, I. I just want to bring you closer to home and tell you we are also going to use Webb to look at uh, things in our own solar system. It turns out Webb is going to look at objects, um, all the planets beyond Mars. We can't look towards the sun, so we can't look at Venus, we can't look at Mercury, we can't look at Earth. We can look at all the planets going outward, as well as things in the asteroid belt, as well as comets, and um, take some very precise measurements of these, um, uh, of these worlds in our own solar system and then leave you with this lovely, beautiful image of Neptune and uh, its moon, Triton. Neptune is this cool moon that um, is in a backwards orbit around, uh, around Neptune. And so we believe it's been captured from the Kuiper belt, which is all these rocks that are way out um, around where Pluto is. But what was great about this image, you can see Triton is a super reflective thing. It actually reflects back like 70% of the light that hits. So Webb at these, at these infrared wavelengths, Triton is super bright, but at those same wavelengths, Neptune itself absorbs a lot of this. And so it's methane atmosphere actually made it look quite dark. But what was super cool is we got the rings of Neptune. We hadn't seen the rings this well since Voyager 2 went to Neptune. So um, solar system uh, people's jaws literally dropped when they saw this image. This image is actually very difficult to make because imagine everything on here moves. The moons move around Neptune, the rings move around, the, 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 the planet itself moves relative to the stars, which means you have to track it funny. And so we had to take very lots of very short images and stack them together very cleverly to get. 
So I thank you for spending your evening with me. I will leave you with one last glorious picture by the James Webb Space Telescope, one of the biggest, brightest star forming regions that are actually in the large Magellanic cloud known as 30 door or the Tarantula Nebula. You're seeing new stars right here, have just been born and now clearing away the gas in this nebula. And it will probably spur on new star formation. And uh, it just, I don't know, it inspires me to see this image. It's like it's breaking through to new knowledge and all the great wondrous things that Webb is going to teach us. So I hope this has inspired you to think of some of the new and fun things that Webb is gonna find because we're looking at the universe in a whole new way. Thank you. This is your friendly website for all of these pictures if you want them for your desktop or to show a class or whatever. I have a little bit of time for questions. I just want to make a quick announcement that if you're taking the shuttle, um, there's no shuttle at 645. Sorry. Sorry. Um, we do have time for questions. I have a question in the back corner. How do we budget time for taking different types of observations between stars and exoplanets or galaxies? It's a very good question. It's a competitive process. So anyone, all of you, are allowed to put in proposals for what you would like James Webb Space Telescope to look at. Uh, these proposals are very hard to put together to be competitive. You have to write a very careful science case about what you're going to learn taking this particular observation. Uh, so typically it tends to be professional astronomers who put them in, but that doesn't mean, that's not limited to them. Anybody who wants to can. It then goes through uh, a time allocation committee where uh, invite learned astronomers to come and review those proposals, decide which will most advance science. And then those are the observations we take. Uh, yeah, what was the cost of the web telescope? Well, who remembers the number? Someone in the room must. It was cheap. What? Ten billion. Thank you. Ten billion. About ten billion dollars over thirty years it took to build it. It was much more expensive than other. We spent more money on chocolate as a nation during that time. Just so you know. What would the satellite telescope actually do? Orbiting or going away, and if it's going away, is there a, a life element as to how long? So it's it's orbiting. It's orbiting that L two point, that second Lagrange point I was talking about. It's in a we call a halo or orbit around that point. It always stays about a one point five million kilometers away. And that is a, a, a an act of gravity. It's an act of station keeping. We have to fire rockets to keep us in that orbit. We, if we let gravity have its way, it'll slowly drift back towards Earth. Well, okay. How long does it take to make a revolution? It's actually uh, several months. It's a very slow orbit. I had read that there was damage by debris on some of the mirrors. So what was the expectation before it was launched for that? We expected to get damage due to debris on the mirrors. Uh, this was well known before we launched. By not putting it in a tube, we knew it was unprotected. Uh, there was many studies done to figure out how um, much debris we expect to have. The reason that made the news is that we early on got one of our big impacts. So that made us wonder, did we just get unlucky or is our model completely wrong? <laughs> so as a result, we are taking some protective elements to not point in the direction the debris is coming, like the direction we're moving through this debris field, right? So we try to point away from it to protect the telescope as much as possible. You're expecting this telescope to last about 20 years? I said the upper limit is going to be about that, yes. <laughs> So if we're looking at this image, do you expect it to change appreciably in 20 years? Or oh, yeah, yeah, thank you for my that image and go on to the next. You're asking if these images will likely change in the next 20 years. Uh, this image probably won't much. The, the life cycle of these stars is just so much longer than 20 years that it'll essentially look the same to us, even though 
in terms of universe universe scales, it's a very dynamic and stars being born, but that's on you know ten thousand year time, a million year time scales. Um, of the images I showed you, uh, possibly that Wolf Rayet star with the fluffy stuff coming off it, the big massive star, might be able to see some changes in twenty years. <laughs> um, but most things, those transits I was showing you, we actually see changes on very rapid time scales, of, you know, a couple of days in that case. Speaking of the 20 year lifespan, do you think that will improve the quality of the images during that period due to improvements in focusing algorithms and firmware updates, or is it pretty much what we have now we're going to have? So over the next couple of years, of, yes, you're asking if the images will improve over those that 20 year time scale. So one of the things I do think will get better is our understanding of our calibrations. So exactly how bright the objects are that we're measuring. Uh, right now we have easily large error bars because we're trying to calibrate it to be exactly right. So that will improve over the next couple of years. If anything, in 20 years, there actually may be some degradation on the mirrors due to our micrometeorites, for instance. So I, so in some ways, some of the images will improve because you'll get more and more images and you can stack them together and you'll improve images. But the actual, like for the same observation taken again in 20 years, you actually might find that there has been, you won't be able to collect quite as much data. Uh, there is a decommissioning plan that does not involve bringing it back to Earth. <laughs> so I think the last little bit of fuel has to be to send it away from Earth so it doesn't crash back into us. I haven't read that decommissioning plan, so don't ask any more details. <laughs> What are the prospects for a robotic refueling mission in 20 years? Oh, um, speak to your congressman. Oh, yeah. What are the prospects for uh, <laughs> for a refueling plan? Uh, I, I don't see that happening for the Webb Space Telescope. It's just so far away, and it wasn't really built to be refueled. But there are some very clever minds out there, so I don't want to say it's impossible. <laughs> right? I, all sorts of impossible things have happened in my lifetime at this point. I'll, I'll, if you want to talk, I can tell you about K2 and the Kepler mission. That was one of them. Um, so yeah, there's some very, so talk to your Congress. This is what you want. This to last longer. I actually might encourage you to then have them fund the Habitable World Observatory faster, <laughs> but I, I'll stay away from politics. Yep. Um, you mentioned that they didn't want to put the telescope in a tube. Um, is that just too limiting? It's it's too much mass, actually. Oh, oh yes. How, why didn't we put the telescope in a tube? And a lot of it is to keep the, the weight really low. We had to have all our weight towards making those big mirrors and having a big sun shield. And so a big tube around all of that would just be expensive to launch. And also would also be one more thing we have to keep cold. And so that's why it doesn't have one of those. Believe it or not, the Webb Space Telescope is uh, lighter than Hubble. Yeah. The mirrors are like this, are made from beryllium, which is this really light, strong material. And then they put this gold coating over it, which is why they shine in gold. Not very much gold, like 50 grams of gold. What's the focal angle of a typical picture you're taking? Focal angle. So, how much degree across the sky? I'm trying to translate the photographer language into my astronomer language. <laughs> Many of these are mosaics, which means they're quite big. But uh, let's see, like the Miri images. So this one, I don't know. So I'm, I, I'm sorry about that. See, and I go back to one where I do. Miri is about 100 arc seconds across. Do you know what an arc second is? Do not as if you do. So I'm very impressed with that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Most of us didn't nod. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm getting there. I can just only do two things at once. Okay, here's an image of Mary. So this is Mary. This is also probably, oh no, this I think was actually just one image. Um, so it's about a hundred arc seconds, which uh, is, okay, so uh, one degree is 3,600 arc seconds. Okay, so it gets split up into, um, you know, there's 60 arc minutes. A degree in 60 arc seconds minutes so it's um and the moon is half a degree does all of that can you translate half a degree it's smaller than that so it's, it's a very tiny amount of it's just so hard to describe it's like 
along the lines of holding a dime at arm's length is, is like the Hubble deep field. So that's, it's a very tiny bit of the sky you're looking at. I forgot two more questions in the red. So I assume the telescope is on 24 seven. Is there some sort of algorithm within it that if it something, you know, that we are really surprised at I mean, we keep reading, you know, oh, a comet has appeared that we never knew about. Is there something to alert the telescope? Is there an algorithm that allows us to alert the telescope to point at something really interesting if we needed to? Or if we didn't even expect it. You know? So we didn't expect. Yeah. So this telescope was not meant for fast turnaround time. It's actually very slow to change its angle and move it around. So the process, if there was a really exciting thing that happened, is to submit a proposal and then have people review it for a week. And then if you're lucky, it's like really time sensitive. We might be able to get on it within about two weeks. And so that, that can happen, but there's no alert system to suddenly say, oh, a gamma ray burst went off. Let's go look over there. It's a rather telescope. Um, in exoplanet studies, and you can tell the atmosphere, can you also start to look at biology and look for life? So, of course, people will try. It was life was so, yes, are we going to look for life in the exoplanets? I don't imagine Webb is going to be able to detect life with the observations we can make. I think the closest we're going to get is find, see things in atmospheres on rocky planets that are similar to things we know that life needs here on Earth. I think it's going to be too uh, hard to, to make those precise um, measurements to get to say there is life. And on top of that, it's very hard to tell there is life. You have these biomarkers you have to look for. It's hard to know that that marker happened only because of life and not due to geological things that are happening on the planet. So even if something like that is detectable. It's going to take a long time for us to figure it out and probably more observations than what Webb can do. We have time for just one more. This is like the most enthusiastic audience I've ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> How long is one orbit of Webb? Well, it orbits around the sun. Is that, I mean, how long is the orbit of Webb? So the orbit around the sun is the same as the Earth, 365 days. The orbit around L2 um, takes several months, six months all the way around, I believe. So it's just six months, every six months it's going by the same spot? It just circles <laughs> around that fictitious point in space. Mm -hmm. And then every couple of weeks we have to oscillate back into that orbit. I mean, something we call staging. Thank you all so much. Thank you.